Well, welcome all of you, uh, and thank you for being here. Um, I uh, enjoy tremendously being here at the Car Center, and I wanted to thank uh, Charlie uh, for having uh, facilitated and really created the opportunity for me to be here, and it's been extremely rewarding, and I, I will never forget this, these three and a half weeks here. And I also wanted to thank uh, Vidya for having um, made it possible to dedicate, devote some time to this very important, uh, painful issue, uh, which, which concerns all of us. And I wanted to thank also Misha uh, for having um, provided me with some, uh, some research which I needed uh, in preparing uh, today's um, uh, talk. Uh, so let me start. And perhaps uh, the first thing indeed I want to say is that my interest and uh, my, my, my um, focus in my professional life on these two topics, namely uh, uh, women and children, um, have not come out of the blue. Um, actually, um, the, my focus was already when I finished my law studies, gender equality and women's rights. Uh, and the rights of children uh, came in a little bit later, but very intensely. And Perhaps, but I, today, unfortunately, there's no time to talk about uh, about children in particular. Um, although uh, Istanbul Con Convention addresses, in some respects, uh, the children's uh, rights. In fact, there are, we have counted them together in Misha. There are 22 entries uh, in the Istanbul Convention which relate to children. But I'll come to that uh, later. But um, my interest in women's rights. Um, and in particular, violence against women. Uh, go back to my um, professional career in the European Court of Human Rights. When I came to Strasbourg um, in the early 70s, the, uh, the, 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 the Greece was a dictatorship, uh, and the colonels were in power, and they employed uh, very nasty uh, interrogation techniques and uh, torture. Uh, and all this was subject of an interstate application before the European Commission of Human Rights brought by uh, the Scandinavian countries and the Netherlands uh, to denounce uh, violations of the European Convention of Human Rights and in particular Article 3 which prohibits inhuman and degrading treatment. And um, we had a number of, I, I was, uh, as I said, a young lawyer at the, at the European Commission of Human Rights which is the predecessor of the European Court of Human Rights and we had these hearings where witnesses and victims of violence, of, of torture, uh, uh, appeared in Strasbourg. And one of these victims was a woman, and I vividly remember her name, but not only her name, her face. Um, she was Anastasia Tsirka, and she was an opponent to the regime and was very courageous, but she had been arrested and she was pregnant. Uh, but she, and uh, when she was detained in the police, office in Athens, she um, had been uh, kicked off the stairs by a police officer with his boots and she lost her baby. And um, when, she, uh, when she made her declarations uh, to the commission, uh, it was absolutely shocking for everybody. But I, and, and, and it really, I think it may have planted the seed for my later action on violence against uh, women. Um, afterwards, there were the police officers who were also hurt, who didn't want to take the oath. One of them said his arm hurt and he couldn't, he couldn't really lift his arm. And then he walked out of the room and took all his files al along. I mean, just to give you a, a picture of, of the very um, unreliable uh, testimonies which we got from the side of the, of the, uh, of the uh, officials and uh, the reliable testimony we got from the, from the victims. But so, that was institutional violence, but um, I just give this example um, to show in a way the relevance of the uh, European uh, Convention of Human Rights Standards and the work of the Council of Europe, which is perfectly normal be because the statute of the Council of Europe provides that member states should abide with principles of human rights, democracy and the rule of law, but at the same time in reality, the, the court operates separately a little bit from the Council of Europe, and the Council of Europe is a bit separate from the court, also geographically separated. And 
what I have tried to do um, is to bring the two institutions closer to together in terms of, of substance and in terms of work. work. So my, my objective was, and still is today, to, uh, to combat every form uh, of a viola uh, attempt to violate uh, women and children's basic human rights. Um, and um, um, perhaps an additional word about when I think about why, what, what, is, what do women and children victims have in common. I think it's more in uh, not so much the, 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 the children, uh, the vict uh, one shouldn't approach this answer to this question through the perspective, lens of the victims, but rather of the perpetrators. And what, what I believe is the problem is that the perpetrator of, of these offenses uh, do not regard their victims as a human being entitled to uh, full respect of his or her human rights, including physical or moral integrity and, uh, above all, human dignity. So children's vulnerability is, is affected by definition um, as from birth, whereas when we talk about uh, uh, women's vulnerability, it is clearly related to the social perception uh, of uh, the subordination of women to men and reflects the uh, relation of power of men and women. It's a reflection of a patriarchal culture. Uh, I gave as a title for my, my presentation today um, uh, behind closed doors, violence has many faces, from denial to the solution, and indeed um, uh, the fact that violence uh, committed by private individuals is still uh, frequently regarded as a private or a family matter, especially if committed at home, at the home, um, is, 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 is a big problem, uh, because that means that uh, society, that's not a considered as an issue of society. Um, as a whole, and let alone um, involve states' uh, accountability. The main obstacle uh, to combat vi violence against women and to prevent it is the denial. Uh, denial it exists, and denial it exists at a large scale. And therefore, um, both the Council of Europe and other international organizations, uh, including CEDAW, uh, have called for comprehensive data and as evidence-based uh, action is more likely to be um, uh, sustainable. Now the latest survey in this respect, I brought it along, I will leave it on the table, um, has been carried out um, by the Fundamental Rights Agency of the European Union, uh, of, uh, which has its seat in, uh, in Vienna, and I'm a member of the management board, and they have produced this um, this. Uh, survey and it's extremely interesting. It, it reveals uh, uh, that in Europe, one in three um, women have uh, suffered uh, acts of violence since the age of 15. Um, I, can, I can give you a breakdown of these uh, forms of of, uh, of violence, but perhaps the most important uh, thing to say is that uh, one in ten uh, has experienced sexual violence. Um, one in 20 has been raped, and 8% of women have been abused in the last 12 months. And of all the age groups uh, polled, young women uh, were found to be particularly vulner vulnerable to violent acts. Um, these data are based on interviews with 42,000 women across uh, the uh, region of the European Union uh, who were asked about their experience in, uh, of physical, sexual, and psychological violence as well as stalking, sexual harassment, uh, and the role played also by new technologies uh, in their experience of abuse. Um, I think that the, the, the importance of uh, such a survey is that it is uh, a precious tool of, in addition to the uh, official records which are made available, uh, because they are, the official records are incomplete, uh, unreliable to the extent that the um, Acts of violence, of course, are underreported. Victims are afraid to report, uh, afraid to speak, afraid or ashamed. And um, also because the, there is a lack of gender dimension uh, uh, or the precise nature of the assault when, uh, or aggression when aggressions or assault are being reported. So this, this, this gives you a very good uh, picture of what is really happening in Europe and I'm sure uh, beyond. 
to be really uh, also complete, I should say that some forms of the sex of, of uh, violence which are uh, covered by the Istanbul Convention, to, I will, to which I will come obviously, um, are not covered by by this uh, survey because we looked at the, uh, the, uh, together with Misha again. We looked at the questions which were which were put and uh, issues like uh, early and forced marriages and uh, forced abortion or sterilization or honor crimes were not specifically addressed in the questions. So they may probably, uh, they could have produced probably uh, results which were would be even more alarming. But I think the figures we have already and what the Council of Europe had, had when it in, uh, start engaged upon this, in this uh, process uh, of drafting uh, legal norms uh, for preventing and combating violence against women uh, are sufficient uh, for the Council of Europe to um, to consider that it was necessary uh, to uh, to proceed with uh, this standard setting. Um, every day, women are stalked, harassed, raped, forced by their family to enter into a marriage, sterilized against their will, or abused psychologically or physically. And it happens everywhere uh, and any time, in the safety of the homes, uh, at work, on the streets, online, uh, in the media, and other contexts. So where we should really hear the screams uh, of the women, um, there's a lot of silence. Uh, there should be an outcry. Uh, and putting an end to this violence should be a top priority for any government uh, that is committed in ensuring human rights at all. We have fortunately witnessed over the last decades, I would say, um, a gradual recognition of these problems, these issues as human rights issues. And this is a major step forward, uh, I would say, and is a huge, of huge significance in terms of state's accountability. You know, if you if you think it's a criminal offence, you hold the offender responsible, and you hope and hopefully prosecution will will end with with uh, conviction. But if you're talking about human rights and human rights violation, it means that you can hold states accountable, and this is absolutely essential. Uh, and this is on, on on the basis of which we we could draft this convention, um, uh, which is the Istanbul Convention. But when this process of, um, st uh, of uh, drafting the convention started, and Charlie has reminded us uh, that this uh, happened in 2005, and there was a summit of the heads of states and government of the Council of Europe, the Council of Europe um, had already undertaken a series of uh, initiatives to, to promote uh, the protection of women against violence. We had a ministerial conference. We had a, actually a, another summit which preceded this, this in 1997, um, in which the issue was also brought up. But uh, it was not uh, not as forceful as it was later. But nevertheless, there was there was a, a basis on the, on which there were a lot of initiatives already could take place, and there were these were based on the fundamental principles that. States have, a, uh, have an obligation to exercise due diligence to prevent, investigate, and punish acts of violence. And secondly, uh, that violence against women needed to be understood in a social context, and not just as, a, as, a, as an example of a, as an unconnected event, uh, uh, because it's, it represents a structural and societal problem uh, based on unequal power relations between women, women and men. So. One of the important tools which preceded the uh, drafting of the uh, Council of Europe Convention uh, against this uh, scourge is uh, a recommendation which dates back to 2002, which actually uh, sets out uh, uh, all the actions, uh, most, or let's say most of the actions which were later uh, included in the in the binding uh, treaty, um, and. Until today, uh, because the Istanbul uh, Convention has not yet entered into force, there is a monitoring process um, which uh, has fed into the, also the drafting process um, for, the, for this convention. And in, I just wanted to mention a few 
uh, issues which um, which came out of the last uh, monitoring round, um, on, which was based on this uh, recommendation of 2002, um, and that is that uh, we can really see in Europe an increased political will to establish a national policy on violence, um, and that, that these policies are increasingly I uh, comprehensive. Uh, which is also shown the fact that, uh, by the fact that our, uh, the um, coordinating uh, bodies have been set up at governmental level. level. Uh, in the legislative process, there is a growing trend to criminalize uh, uh, more forms of violence against women, such as forced marriage uh, and stalking. Member states have increased their uh, training efforts, uh, training of professionals uh, who deal with women victims of violence. And there is also a lot of emphasis on the role of education in preventing violence against women. Um, and, that, and that is very important that is increasingly recognized. So those are the good signals. But of course, there are, as we all know, uh, ch as we call it, challenges. And, and one of these challenges um, is in particular, the failure to allocate resources uh, to the necessary um, uh, measures which do have to be taken and to address the problem uh, of violence against women effectively. But um, let me then turn to, to the Warsaw Summit. Uh, so, I mean, I, I remember very well <laughs> how this sentence in the Warsaw Declaration uh, on which we could further build came about. I was just sitting in a cafe with a, with a friend who was the Finnish ambassador to, uh, to the Council of Europe. And uh, of course, there was a long preparatory process of the, the declaration of the Warsaw Summit, and it was about gender equality, which was fine. But I, we wanted this to be much more specific. We wanted to address violence against women. So. Um, I came out of this uh, out of this coffee uh, break with her, and uh, I went to the chair, and I said that this is not clear enough. We have to really be very uh, assertive when 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 we come to, when we really want to do something about uh, violence against women. So um, let's put it in. Uh, let really let's formulate it in the declaration. And so at the end there was this sentence, we are committed to eradicating violence against women and children, including domestic violence. Good. It was there. It was the basis for all the further action. Of course, uh, there, there was a need for an action plan, uh, and uh, this action plan provided in the first place the setting up of a task force, which was to evaluate progress at national level, with reference obviously to the uh, implementation and monitoring of the implementation of the recommendation of 2002. And also, uh, this, well, this task force was uh, expected to draw up a, a, a blueprint for action. Uh, and at the same time, uh, it initiated a campaign, a campaign to, to combat violence against women, um, which was, uh, so which well, had to be prepared in close cooperation with the uh, with the other European and national actors, and including uh, NGOs. So this task force was, uh, was appointed uh, by the Secretary General of the Council of Europe, and it oversaw the implementation between 2006 and 2008 of this campaign. Uh, the campaign was uh, conducted at various levels, local, governmental, and parliamentarian. Uh, parliamentary, and it had basically four pillars, um, legal and policy measures, uh, support and protection for victims, data collection and awareness raising. Um, uh, we produced posters, uh, calendars, flyers, um, uh, which say it starts with a scream and must never end in silence. I don't know whether we have here the example of our campaign, but uh, I should have brought it along. It was a very telling photo of a face of a woman, just like, you know, like if, if you destroy a piece of paper you know, and you get it out of the bin and it's full of full of scars, and uh, so it was very uh, full of, yeah. Anyway, what was important that there was a strong parliamentary dimension uh, to this campaign. Uh, the, par the various parliaments in the in Council of Europe region organized uh, debates and hearings, and uh, it's revealed the magnitude uh, of, the, of the problem in Europe, but uh, it also brought to light good examples of, uh, of good examples of good practice and initiatives in many different member states. It, it had, a, of course, the uh, added value of increasing the awareness amongst key actors and also 
perhaps has facilitated uh, the possibility for women to to speak out and uh, and and talk about their their, their suffering. So, uh, but in, at the end of the day, what the campaign really revealed, and that is what I hoped, uh, was there was a really a need for a legally binding instrument to improve and harmonize standards throughout Europe. Um, so, what the, what, the, what the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe did is to create a, a multidisciplinary ad hoc committee on preventing combating violence against women. That was in December 2008. Um, and the committee started its work, I mean, actually, uh, into in, in immediately. Um, the composition um, of the committee was multidisciplinary. It meant that there were representatives of various uh, ministries, uh, uh, varying according to countries, Minister of Interior, Minister of Ju Ministry of Justice, um, um, so, so more or less four, four delegates per country. And uh, they held um, nine, a total of nine, nine meetings, each of them uh, during lasting one week. And so they were sitting around the table, government representatives. But of course, we also had representatives of civil society, parliamentarians, and uh, representatives of international organizations. In December 2010, the draft was ready uh, for transmission to the Committee of Ministers. And in January 2011, uh, the explanatory report was approved and uh, submitted to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, who expressed an opinion. And then in uh, Turkey, on the 11th of May 2011, the convention was opened uh, for signature in Istanbul, hence its name. So this is... This was the process, but I would like to go a little bit beyond the surface of what uh, looks like a sort of um, relatively straightforward and smooth process of negotiations. And the first thing which was very unusual, that uh, the drafting committee which was set up to negotiate the, the text was provided with a mandate that did not uh, define the exact scope of the, of the treaty, but left room for several options. So there was a debate on whether or not to dedicate the entire treaty to address um, uh, the different forms of domestic violence or to address domestic violence in the context of violence against women as one of the many forms uh, of such violence. And that took a long, long... Uh, do you understand what I mean? Uh, I mean, it's basically... Um, it's violence against women from a gender perspective versus uh, domestic violence from a gender neutral pr perspective. And that took a long, long time to discuss, but um, uh, at the end of the, of the day, uh, the initial difference of opinion on the scope of the convention, the choice between these two options, resulted uh, in a compromise which, had, uh, cont which actually continued to surface uh, in the course of the negotiations. Um, it was important to counterbalance uh, the de definition of domestic violence as gender neutral, uh, which was promoted by a significant number of delegations, um, because uh, the inclusion of family members threatened uh, the uh, ability of the Convention to address the root causes uh, of violence against women in all member states, and that is discrimination discrimination against women uh, and gender uh, imbalance uh, in the protection of human rights. So the compromise at the end of the day was the focus of the convention was to be on all forms of violence against women, which include domestic violence committed against women. But, uh, but it was because also the, the negotiator uh, uh, considered it important to em emphasize that the overwhelming majority of victims of the domestic violence are women. women. But at the same time, they didn't want to exclude the, uh, and, and also want to enshrine the principle that also men and children and elderly uh, could be subject uh, uh, to violence uh, and that they were not excluded from the scope. So, in fact, uh, what has happened is that if, if the convention is basically designed, uh, the, the approach is, uh, is, is uh, through the lens of the perspective of, of women, um, there is the possibility for member states that um, uh, parties uh, to uh, can extend uh, the application of this convention to all victims of do domestic violence. So um, that is also a very pragmatic approach, and, uh, which was 
based uh, on, the, on the results of the existing research, which showed that uh, women are disproportionately affected by the gender-based violence. So not only the scope, but all other basic issues uh, seriously put at risk the added value of the convention. Many delegations wanted to water down the, uh, the draft, um, but uh, we managed to isolate these delegations who, who had these ten tendencies, uh, after which they gave up, or uh, we, uh, we uh, as a compromise, accepted to have uh, uh, an amended wording in the explanatory report in order to accommodate, uh, as far as possible, these issues. Uh, I mentioned that the, convention, the draft convention went to the Parliamentary Assembly. This is standard procedure in the Council of Europe. Uh, but the, also the Parliamentary Assembly had some problems. They did not want to reopen the discussion on the scope of the convention. But uh, they had concerns, uh, and some of these concerns were that they considered there was in inadequate protection for some specific vulnerable groups such as children, elderly people and migrant women without a legal resident status because these women without legal resident status came only uh, were only mentioned uh, in case of their losing uh, their residence status as a result of the dissolution of their uh, relation or relationship with their uh, spouse or partner as a consequence of their being a victim of, of violence and the uh, Parliamentary Assembly thought that there should be more, more, uh, more rights uh, in, in the Convention which related to these specific groups. Um, they also considered that there was um, too much flexibility as when it came to the issue of prosecution uh, or how to sanction some forms of violence. Um, they were not in agreement with the latitude left to the member states as far as reservations are concerned and indeed uh, uh, quite understandably because uh, some rather basic provisions uh, like uh, for instance the fact that um, uh, prosecution could, could take place without uh, a, a complaint by the victim uh, or should take place without a complaint funded by a victim that uh, can also be subject to a reservation uh, which is based on the fact that, of course, many there are different legal systems and uh, systems in which criminal proceedings can sometimes, according to domestic law, only be uh, initiated on, a, on the basis of a complaint. So, but um, eventually, uh, in spite of some of really valid observations, uh, also <laughs> because there, the, time, the, the time was pressing, uh, the text was adopted as it stood with some minor amendments in the explanatory report, and uh, so it looked as if it was going to, to be fine. And then the, the text came to the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe, who is the, uh, the body uh, in the Council of Europe who is decision-making body. Uh, and normally, um, when experts have gone through this, when the process has been so thorough as it had been, uh, there should not be uh, much discussion, but this was unfortunately and not the case so very surprisingly when it came to the um, to the committee of ministers um, at a ambassadorial level in Strasbourg there were again last minute attempts to undermine uh, the, the convention to reopen discussions about very important questions of principle which uh, would have really uh, uh, taken away all the added value of the convention and actually made, made the whole convention useless and so I just wanted to give you one or two examples of that, and one of them was a um, very basic uh, observation by one delegation which uh, had problems with reference uh, to violence against women as a violation of human rights. Uh, and to replace it with the expression, violence against women constitutes a serious obstacle for women's enjoyment of human rights. Now, if you see the, 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 the you, you understand the, the difference. I mean, if, uh, rather than a human rights violation itself, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was an impediment for the enjoyment of uh, obstacle to other uh, human rights. Um, uh, and because this, uh, they, they argued that this was inco incompatible with um, the fundamental principles of human rights law. Um, now, if they, this delegation had had uh, had, uh, were, uh, had got what what they wanted to achieve, uh, it would obviously have limited the legal obligation on states to address the issue and undermine the importance. 
Um, it would also have meant undermining what had already been achieved uh, at international level, including uh, the findings of CEDO, um, the wording which had the very wording of the recommendation which we already had in the Council of Europe, the preamble to the Belém do Para Convention, which is the uh, another regional instrument in this area, uh, the Inter-American uh, Convention on Violence Against Women. So that would have been terrible, but they did not succeed. Um, then there were uh, countries who had problems with the principle of uh, due state responsibility, including uh, uh, due diligence, and that again, accepting that argument would have been contrary to the case law of the court, which, uh, which had just ruled uh, uh, in a case against Tur Turkey uh, that, uh, that the um, positive obligation to protect the right of life uh, required state authorities to display due diligence, for, for example, by taking preventive operational measures uh, in protecting an individual whose life is at risk. Um, yes, you work at the court, you're presumably familiar with that case, uh, and it's, uh, it was a tragic case of, um, of a woman who had alerted the police on many occasions uh, because, against, uh, because of she was subject to violence by her husband, but uh, every time she went to the police station, uh, she was sort of laughed away and sent home and stopped, uh, told not, no, to, not to be silly anymore, and it ended uh, very tra tragically in a loss of life. So um, that is... Uh, this shows the importance of the, the concept of positive uh, obligations under the European Convention of Human Rights, and uh, which is the equivalent of, of due diligence. So all these attempts, which were really meant to undermine, uh, designed to undermine the whole process, uh, were resisted by the Secretariat. Uh, I came in occasionally when it really got bad, but then left the room again to the negotiator. But there were in the room permanently also uh, civil society, women's lobby, Amnesty International, uh, they did a great job in resisting uh, all these uh, all these attempts, uh, and um, we also had the benefit of uh, the opinion of our legal advisor, uh, who uh, could confirm that it was not incompatible with existing international law. So that was fine. And there was another major issue was the proposal by a number of delegations uh, to delete a sexual orientation and gender identity uh, as unacceptable grounds of discrimination, which would have excluded uh, violence against uh, lesbian, bisexual, and uh, transgender women from the scope of this treaty. Um, one of the arguments was, uh, you know, this is legal recognition of same-sex partner partners. We were not ready for that. Uh, but that was not what the convention was about, um, and it would uh, and it would was particularly important to to have this uh, this um, uh, discrimination discrimination ground mentioned because the thresholds uh, for lesbian women to seek help for domestic uh, violence uh, and other forms of abuse is still very high in all our member states. So that attempt was also unsuccessful. Um, then Louise may be interested to hear also that um, there is there was this provision relating to the gender-based asylum claims and the principle of non-refoulement, which uh, consisted in recognizing uh, some forms of violence as a form of gender-related uh, related persecution within the meaning of the 1951 Convention, um, giving rise to subsidiary protection. Um, one of these amendments would have raised the level of risk uh, of persecution uh, that would have to be proven to avail oneself of this right of to non refoulement. But the active participation of the UNHCR in uh, representative really uh, was extremely helpful, and it confirmed that the that the text was in fully in line with uh, with the state's obligations under international law, and that the full support of the UNHCR. There were problems with the monitoring mechanism, uh, which, uh, as I will later explain, uh, is uh, a sort of interaction between a body of inter independent experts and a committee of the parties, and one of the uh, delegations wanted the republication of the reports uh, to be within the ju exclusive uh, jurisdiction of the committee of the parties, the parties rather than the independent uh, monitoring body. Um, then the same the, the same party wanted this uh, committee of the parties to to assess the validity of reservations um, to the treaty, uh, which was 
because it was intended to be in the hands of, of this monitoring body, but they wanted to move it to the uh, to the state uh, state uh, the committee of the state parties. Another very important uh, uh, issue and a quite uh, longly long debated issue was the sociological definition of gender, uh, which uh, and the the, the the big opponent of this uh, of this concept which was actually a novelty in international law, was, was the Holy See, who is an observer state to the Council of Europe. In their mind, this would destroy the ordinary meaning of men and women, which in, with, and I'm quoting, with an incalculable legal and social consequences. And the only acceptable definition for them of gender was the one which is in the ICC Statute of Rome. But the Holy See was isolated and did not get support for this pr proposal. Then there were some problems in relation to the question of emergency barring orders. Uh, Ireland had proper problems with that uh, on the basis of the property rights uh, and as it would require constitutional amendments. There were problems with the, as I said earlier, I think with the ex parte and ex officio proceedings, to, um, but um, in the end uh, everything uh, was, uh, as we will see uh, in a moment, uh, it, it was accepted, and uh, after long negotiations, I must say, um, we got this treaty uh, off the ground, uh, and it was, as I said before, opened for signature. So now, uh, after this introduction, which gives you a little bit of a flavor of the difficulties in the negotiation, and I think it's important to bear this in mind when, uh, when and if we discuss the possibility of uh, drafting a global treaty. Uh, I would like now to come to really what we what we have on the table, and um, uh, that is that the Istanbul Convention recognizes violence against women as a human rights violation and a form of discrimination. Um, let me just have some water. <laughs> quarter past two, and we have until three. So we have a text with 81 articles separated in the two ch uh, 12 chapters. Um, the convention is, structure, convention is structured around the three Ps, prevention, protection, and prosecution. For this convention, there's also a fourth P, which, is the, uh, which represents the, uh, the integrated, holistic, and coordinated policies. Uh, which calls for a coordinated action of law enforcement agencies, judiciary, social services, institutions, NGOs, civil society, policy makers, and uh, with the support of the media. So I've already uh, referred to the, um, to, the, uh, to the definition of uh, gender, which is and remains a sensitive uh, issue and uh, constitutes presumably for some countries an obstacle uh, to ratification. Another important principle enshrined in the Convention is that nobody can ever invoke culture, custom, religion, tradition, or so-called honor to justify any act of violence covered by the Convention. So claims that victims have transgressed uh, the, uh, the, 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 these, these norms, these, uh, yes, these norms are, uh, are not acceptable. And this uh, obligation extends also to uh, the prevention of official statements uh, condoning violence or uh, on any of these grounds. The Istanbul Convention takes a vital cross-border approach, uh, given the transitional, transnational nature of some of the forms of violence against women. Forced marriages, for, for example, uh, often entail crossing borders because children or adults are taken uh, abroad for this purpose. And the Istanbul Convention makes clear that this uh, conduct, that the such conduct, is a crime. Um, an important dimension of the Convention, uh, which is relevant for the increase of the prosecution rates, which are still very low, is that um, it makes it that the Istanbul Convention makes it obligatory for states parties to extend their jurisdiction to cover crimes committed abroad by their nationals. Uh, and even makes it possible to pr prosecute their residents. And conversely, the Istanbul Convention creates a framework for greater access uh, to justice for nationals or residents of state parties who become victims of crimes 
uh, or violence against women while uh, abroad. We have talked about already the UN Convention, uh, the, the refugee, uh, 1951 UN uh, Convention relating to the status of uh, refugees. So it's it's considered as a form of persecution um, when the refugee status or international subsidiary protection for women is being determined, which is important because women may be fleeing from rape as used uh, used as a weapon of war, female genital mutilation, or a life of domestic violence. Um, another important feature is the protection the convention offers to particular vulnerable people, such as member of the Im members of the immigrant community, uh, ethnic minorities, uh, persons with disabilities, uh, pregnant women and women with young children, persons living in rural or remote areas, as well as persons uh, affected by substance abuse. Um, for women, um, migrant women who, are, can, who can find themselves trapped in abusive relationship, uh, the Inter Istanbul Convention introduces a number of protection measures, including the option uh, of providing uh, her, uh, uh, granting them an autonomous residence permit, uh, independent uh, of that of their violent spouse or partner. Um, for, girl, for girls which have been forcefully married um, abroad, the loss of acquired residence uh, status after prolonged absence uh, was also considered and the Istanbul Convention enables them to regain their residence status. So that's also a very good um, provision uh, which takes into consideration uh, the real uh, effects of uh, some of the the the, the, uh, the terrible effects uh, of of this of this form of violence. Ending impunity is one of the objectives of the convention. So, in terms of criminal law, uh, the convention contains uh, uh, provisions aimed at preventing and combating uh, the widest possible range of forms of violence against women and domestic violence. So I, I think I've mentioned them already, so I'm not going to uh, sum them up again. Um, there are also civil law remedies for victims to seek justice. Uh, that includes compensation and uh, compensation against the perpetrators, but also compensation against the state for failure to abide with due diligence. Civil remedies are also in, important because um, they allow for, uh, for instance, for uh, they include barring orders, um, restraining orders, uh, non molestation orders. Um, again, uh, the the need for vulnerable per persons uh, should be brought, highlighted uh, to make sure that there is recognition and inclusion. In, in the measures which are uh, set up uh, under uh, as an obligation under this convention, um, inclusion uh, recognition meet, means knowledge uh, what, what about these specific groups, and it also means inclusion. Uh, it means that all measures taken to prevent and combat violence um, against women, um, from the development of policies to uh, to the provision of support services, access for vulnerable groups. Uh, should be provided without discrimination. Protection measures uh, to be established or consolidated when they are already in existence cons consist in setting up of shelters, telephone helplines, creation or uh, better organization of social welfare services, um, as I said, protection orders. And states, when they design and implement the, all these measures, uh, are expected to involve the various national agencies and actors uh, concerned. Again, the judiciary, the police, the service providers, the NGOs, as well as national, regional, local parliaments and authorities. Setting up the relevant uh, coordinating body. Um, states are expected to cooperate with each other. International cooperation is, is important. And um, Finally, uh, there is this monitoring mechanism which will enter into uh, force uh, after three months after the, the tenth ratification uh, of the Istanbul Convention. We are currently at eight ratifications. Um, I expect this to happen next this year, uh, as I know that uh, the process of ratification is being debated in a number of countries. 
the fact that this takes a little while is for me not a particular cause of concern. I think it's very it's, it's, it's uh, significant for the serious approach adopted by many of our member states because they need to amend their legislation and need to amend their practice. And I prefer to, to have a later ratification and a strong, uh, meaningful uh, instrument rather than uh, uh, a, 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 a treaty which entered into force as a result of ratifications which later on uh, will show uh, a lot of deficiencies in compliance. The monetary ex uh, ex uh, mechanism consists uh, in two of two pillars, the group of experts, uh, as I said, uh, which will be called Grevio, group of uh, states, group of violence against women, I, I can't remember why it's called Grevio, anyway, it doesn't matter. It's called Grevio, and there are uh, there is the committee of the parties. Grevio will be composed of 10 members in the beginning, and after 25 ratification, that will uh, grow to 15 uh, uh, 15 members. Um, the monitoring mechanism is basically a report-based report procedure, but it can also uh, be uh, completed by uh, country visits, uh, should the information provided by the states uh, be insufficient, or as part of an inquiry uh, into large-scale violations of the Convention. Um, once the information is available, a graveyard will adopt a final report. Uh, and conclusions uh, concerning the measures uh, taken to implement the Convention. And uh, upon receipt of Gravio's report uh, the, uh, and the conclusions, the Committee of the State Parties may use recommendations, uh, may issue uh, recommendations to the State Parties uh, under review and request it to submit information on their implementation. I think that the um, I have the firm belief that this uh, Gravio platform will provide, it will really be a unique uh, op opportunity for us to collect very valuable data, including uh, good practices, uh, but it will also provide uh, uh, valuable advice and support uh, thanks to the in-depth analysis of the various national contexts and the mobilization of expertise and exchange of good practices. I think this convention is an excellent example of the cycle of change which the Council of Europe uh, is so proud to produce in these basic human rights areas. You know, when I talk about cycle of change, it's the, it's the process from standard setting to monitoring to assistance program, uh, pro programs um, to bring again the states up to the level uh, of the standards required uh, combined with, uh, with, uh, with uh, campaign uh, capacity. So I'm coming to an end now. I, let me just one, say one more thing. I, as I started with children, um, I would like also to end with children. Um, as I said, uh, there are a number of entries into, in the convention which talk about children. <laughs> and in, indeed, some of the convention contains, uh, contain provisions which address specific needs uh, and interests. <coughs> of the girl child doing away with harmful practices, excuse me. <coughs> ah. <coughs> ah, sorry. So a strong focus on women and girls, <coughs> the reason being that they are mainly exposed to violence and exclusively when it comes to <coughs> female genital, genital mutilation and forced sterilization and abortions. But that doesn't mean that the Convention doesn't of offer protection to boys, <coughs> as the text is drafted in a gender-neutral way. But as I said in the beginning, um, as far as women and girls, whereas the Convention uh, applies to women and, uh, and girls automatically, for boys to be protected, it requires a, a specific declaration by the contracting party that it extends the scope of the provisions, the scope of the convention to boys. So it is a bit uh, bizarre that boys are fully protected as witnesses, but do not benefit automatically from the same protection as girls.
I think that's the shortcoming of the convention, but it has an explanation in the history of the convention. Of course, the specific issue of sexual violence is addressed by the Lanzarote Convention. So from that point of view, the boys are relatively safe. Um, I would like to conclude by saying that uh, through this convention, um, the Council of Europe has um, fully recognize the importance of framing the convention within the wider context of achieving substantive equality between women and men. Much hope is being placed, as I said before, in the work of Grevio, um, and uh, its work will no doubt help to obtain a more accurate picture of the situation in the various countries, and sharing experiences and joint action will be invaluable. The convention is an open convention, as, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, I think. It's open to non-member states, and it has, therefore, a potential to become a global <coughs> tool. Um, some uh, countries in the European neighborhood who have already expressed an interest. Um, I personally travel to many parts of the world to meet various interlocutors, uh, heads of states, ministers, parliamentarians, representatives of the judiciary, of civil society and others to share with them our experience and our willingness to cooperate. Some people are skeptical about the global potential of our convention uh, and it's true that the standards are high and not easy to achieve, uh, let alone to comply with, but it's my view that objective, ob objectives need to be ambitious. And the fallback position is that at least the standards set out in the Istanbul Convention can serve as a reference and inspiration for laws and policies worldwide. We have set up strategic partnership with the European Union, UN, uh, in particular UN Women, and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. I personally initiated and negotiated a number of uh, cooperation agreements with them, so, uh, such as UN Women, UNICEF, and the Organization of American States because uh, the, and the obvious purpose of that is to, uh, to ensure uh, coordination and cooperation, uh, to avoid duplication and ensure application of the highest standards. Um, the convention, overall purpose of the convention is to introduce a new approach uh, to violence prevention and victim protection by requiring all relevant actors uh, to cooperate and coordinate in order to weave a net of safety around the victims. But above, above all, uh, it is to, the purpose is to seek to change the hearts and minds of individuals by calling on all members of society, in particular men and boys, to change attitudes and to create a culture of zero tolerance uh, against violence. Combating gender stereotypes and sexism supported by the media sector and through them society at large is crucial. So the promotion of gender equality and the deconstruction of gender stereotypes must start as early as possible and therefore education establishments also have an important role to play from the kindergarten to the car center. So let's work all together on this, wherever we are and in whatever capacity. Thank you. Thank you, Maud. So um, let's take some questions. I'm sure we all have lots of different thoughts. And Charlie? Uh, Maud, thank you. That was terrific. Uh, a lot to think about. Um, one of my questions is very basic. When does this become applicable law uh, in countries of the Council uh, as it enters force or only as they ratify it? Uh, what is the... As it enters into force. Wow, so, so even if they haven't... Uh, but in relation to those who have ratified it. So the ratification of the eight who have ratifi ratified today has not, has not, doesn't produce any effect uh, until it enters into force because then it's then the whole mechanism of monitoring uh, is, is, becomes operational. But the ratification uh, is a result of uh, an act of parliament. So domestically, it, has, it, has, it produces its effect. But the international effect is only, uh, becomes only uh, operational on the day, uh, three months after the day of ratification, of the 10th ratification. Uh, 
I'm not sure I follow that. So, so I, I, I know it interports in the countries that have ratified it. Yes. Uh, but in the other countries, it, it has to remain until they ratify it. So absolutely, right. absolutely. Is yeah. there a period after which it would become customary internet, uh, you know, European law, uh, like in 10 years after this, if they hadn't ratified it, would it be subsumed under customary law somehow, or they still have to wait for ratification? No, no, I mean, a country, a country is not bound by the provisions of this treaty until they have ratified, right? So, uh, I mean, a country which is, uh, I mean, signature doesn't mean much. It's just, it's a commitment, sort of, we will in the future do something. But binding uh, obligations result from the ratification with internal effect immediately. But the, uh, the international dimension, which means uh, the fact that the, these countries are submitted uh, subject to a, a monitoring mechanism can only occur after, as I said, the 10th ratifica ratification. And what is your best guess, of, uh, of my last question, I want to help us understand, what is your best guess as to, you know, there are 47 nations in the, in the, in the council today, uh, do you think that eventually Yes, uh, I would say something like uh, 35 would be sort of, yeah, the, 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 expect, the expected field. There are some countries where I am pretty uh, uh, pessimistic, uh, who do not like this definition of uh, social, uh, socially constructed definition of gender. Uh, and um, the fact that uh, that there, the, the discrimination uh, uh, amongst the discrimination ground is uh, the, the the gender identity uh, that is for some countries really problematic, uh, and I don't see a, a quick solution there. But otherwise, I mean, given the enthusiasm and the and the continuing and intensification of of the debate. Uh, uh, on this issue uh, in Europe and worldwide really helps, and I, I'm, I'm optimistic in that respect. Mm. Yes, Louise? This was wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Lord. And I was very pleased to hear, and I had no other expectation, that you would have very active cooperation with UNHCR on mm -hmm. the asylum-seeking or mm -hmm. protection-seeking persons uh, to have coverage in the convention just for the benefit um, we have already cases <coughs> especially from Canada United States where uh, the social uh, criteria of persecution so that women who uh, Mo, uh, Mo mentioned could apply for asylum forced uh, marriage uh, genital mm -hmm. mutilation is uh, is um, coming to the forefront more and more, and, and that's why this convention is so important, that we get another standard mm -hmm. to buttress our claim, or the claims by attorneys and of asylum seekers. Uh, because when you present a case, and, and therefore we are so grateful because uh, so many cases are being presented under the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 3, Article 6, Article 13, mm. so that we get mm. a really strong laboratory for uh, defending uh, human rights uh, and, and the human rights of refugees. So um, I was very pleased that you, you mentioned that and um, that we get something more. Of course, it's a small, but small is beautiful. And it's, it's at a very significant standard of those member states who have participated mm. in the process. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the European Convention on Human Rights of 1950 was only possible after World War II, and that you got it on the way, how you got it on the way, it's really uh, quite an uh, achievement. And so uh, I think we shouldn't have the standards too high, but uh, you have contributed a lot, you personally and the Council, to set uh, some more uh, measure sits, as Rosalind Higgins would say in the International Court of Human uh, Justice. Justice, to to get states head to be accountable. Mm. Sure. 
Yes. No, no, this, um, this extension of, um, of uh, grounds for granting uh, protection under the 1951 Convention to include uh, this kind of uh, violence is, 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 I think, it's not a little thing. It's no. not small. It's big. It's okay. really big. Yeah. So that's Depends great. on the application. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so you talked about how the Convention is moving to criminalize certain things such as stalking and mm -hmm. forced marriage. How does the Convention treat um, acts of prejudice against women that aren't maybe so black and white? Maybe doesn't constitute actual violence against women, but like harassment, no. gender bias in the workplace, those kinds of elements. No, harassment is part is part of the uh, of the uh, of the um, sexual har sexual harassment is is part of, of the uh, of the provisions which are uh, where parties are expected to take measures in terms of legislation. Um, and and adopt and and uh, in, uh, combined with uh, with um, with sanctions, so um, I think we're a bit pretty close to what you've just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, Article 40 of the of the Convention. So it, we are we have that as a prohibited form of uh, of, of violence. I mean, violence is not just physical; it's psychological as well. It's just as devastating consequences as physical violence. Yes. Hi. Um, you mentioned <coughs> repercussions that would uh, fall upon uh, member states that didn't uh, or that didn't uphold their part of the convention. Um, is there are were there any plans or are there anything any future plans or something that's already in place to reward countries that you find? Or at the top of mm. the list, or or, or, or taking the, mm. the forefront of doing these things the way you know, abide by the convention, so that yeah. you have kind of a push and pull uh, motivation for people to want to uh, abide by it. Yeah, um, I think that um, one should distinguish the uh, the mechanism of the monitoring. Uh, the monitoring mechanism which is foreseen in this convention from uh, a situation which would arise as a, as a result of a judgment of by the European Court of Human Rights because that is a finding of a violation and it calls for uh, implementation of a judgment I mean it's a legal obligation and uh, this is something which uh, which would have to happen uh, if uh, an act of violence uh, like the case against Turkey, which I mentioned, had been uh, uh, had been uh, considered to be a breach of the convention uh, because of the failure of the authorities to investigate, um, and which would need to uh, change in legislation or practice, and also would uh, provide for compensation to the victim. But that is a finding of the European Court of Human Rights. This mechanism, which I uh, which I've tried to describe, is really um, a sort of yes, a platform for uh, uh, for rewarding countries uh, in terms of uh, uh, when, when they are able to provide examples of good practice and share it with other member states. Uh, uh, ranking. Uh, like we, we haven't come to that yet, but I mean, but there could be something like like ranking at some point. Uh, I mean, in, like like there exists for corruption uh, that could, I mean, could 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 be envisaged, but. I think that uh, I, I'm always in favor of a sort of positive approach. I mean, uh, of course, it should be highlighted if countries do not apply, but uh, uh, to, to, to name and shame is not necessarily going to help. Uh, what is going to help is that you identify uh, things which work and which can be, can be also reproduced in other, in other countries and uh, at other levels. Uh, so I think, but I mean, this is up to this uh, this expert committee to to work out its working methods uh, and to see how they want to, what they want to do with the results of their of their work, uh, their inquiries, and how and, and how and to assess how it can benefit women uh, and girls not only in that country but also in Europe and uh, beyond. Because uh, again, uh, although uh, there may be difficulties if we're Member, uh, for non-member states of the Council of Europe uh, to accede to this convention, uh, what the, uh, if the reports which are made public can obviously be shared uh, worldwide and ins inspire other, co other countries to, uh, to act accordingly.
Yes. And thank you so much for speaking with us today. Um, you had briefly touched on in the end the value of education in the entire process mm -hmm. of fighting against uh, violence against women. Um, this is something that uh, uh, there's a Harvard Gender Violence Project that uh, was also started in the wake of the uh, Delhi gang rape. And uh, a large part of the conversation now um, has been trying to understand how education can be used to, ch uh, to change and shape uh, boys' attitudes towards yes. girls from a very, very young age. Um, what do you think are the, what, what do you think is the way forward in something like this? But again, I think uh, when we are talking here about education, um, it's, uh, this issue of violence against women should be uh, placed in the context of, uh, of uh, equality between women and men. Uh, and, uh, it's, and it's a human rights education. So and, uh, it's for each institution or country to decide from which moment on it should start. But my belief is that it should start very, very early. And uh, the Council of Europe has produced uh, a different uh, manuals on human rights education. Uh, it's called COMPASS. And it contains uh, really a, a practical guide for the, for the teachers, uh, how to teach human rights on the basis of very you know, sort of easy examples. And there's a, a child-friendly version, which is called COMPASSITO. And uh, that, in, that includes precisely the issue of gender equality and uh, I mean this is a starting point and from there on you can uh, everybody can develop further further uh, teaching material but uh, I think it is um, um, uh, absolutely essential that uh, that the uh, the question of um, violence against women uh, should be put in the context of human rights education and that uh, is unfortunately something which is lacking in many, many parts of the world. Um, but in the Council of Europe, we're trying to promote it. And, uh, and I encourage this project, because it's very important. Yeah. Hmm? Yes? I mean, I'm very naive on politics and lawmaking, so um, and explain to me the theory of change here. Uh, a group of you got together, produced a document, and said, we all agree we should do this then everybody goes home and figures out how to implement it. I mean, theory of change to me, there's an input, there's a process, there's an output, outcome, impact, that sort of thing. It, how does this get followed through to reducing violence? Is it that when a person gets abused, they've got to find a lawyer, go to court, and then this law hopefully will get implemented? Is that how it is? No, I mean, this sets a framework uh, for uh, the various relevant actors in each state to, uh, to create a structure within which violence can be prevented and, and can be reported and be sanctioned. I mean, it gives a very clear indication of what of, you should look at the convention. And which state means which country, you mean? The member states of the Council of Europe who have drafted it. The, 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 you, you refer to a group of people. I mean, they were represented, representing a country. Uh, and uh, so this is an intergovernmental piece of work. Uh, uh, experts from 47 member states sat around the table, produced this text, which is be, being agreed to come. Everybody, I mean, they, they come from very different legal systems. Uh, Anglo-Saxon system, uh, uh, countries like France, with the uh, Code of Napoleon being the, uh, the basis of their legal system. Uh, so, I mean, it's it's really uh, it was uh, quite extraordinary to to have people agree on on principles which are set out uh, in this convention, and uh, it, it it puts very specific, very clear, clearly formulated recommendations. Uh, it obliges member states to adopt very clearly formulated measures in terms of uh, creating and uh, changing their laws as far as um, uh, uh, competence is concer concerned, uh, the statute of lim limitation. Uh, I mean, and so all this has to be implemented. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't happen, either the state doesn't ratify, or if it has ratified, at some point this monitoring committee will say, hey, you've said you, you are in compliance, but you're not, because you haven't done what you are expected to do. And so, uh, so that's, that's the international mechanism. But 
domestically uh, as a result of this obligation which states uh, take upon them they are they are creating um, the, the, the tools for the victims to claim compensation uh, to prevent violence to occur through the various measures which uh, we have outlined uh, and so but the chapter prevention protection and uh, prosecution are all addressed in this convention and they require specific measures which should build this safety net again ar around the victims. Do you have specific measures? It's yes, please, yeah, I mean, read it. Are they actually like best practices that have been proved or something you're suggesting well, that the, probably the, work? The best practices are, are uh, which had been collected in the follow-up of this recommendation which dates back to 2002 uh, were uh, taken into consideration when the, the, the these obligations were being drafted. So it's something which is feasible, you know, not something which is abs uh, totally impossible uh, to achieve. And ultimately the framework is that which will make laws. Yes, okay. laws and practice, yeah. Practice too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You wanted to ask something? Yes. yes. Uh, I wanted to say, Africa, um, how is the convention, is it specifically Europe for now? Mm -hmm. No, it's uh, you know it's uh, a convention as I said. I think it's made in Europe, but not for Europe only. If it's made in Europe, it doesn't mean that it contains only principles which are specific to Europe. They are based on universal values and principles: respect, human dignity, equality. This is something which is not being invented in Europe. This exists at universal level. Uh, so uh, the terminology chosen and the and the, the scope uh, of protection or, uh, afforded by the convention is something to which African countries could buy in. And in fact, uh, currently Morocco is one of the first countries not belonging to the European continent is considering adhering to this convention. We haven't had uh, so far contacts with uh, with them, but of course, as soon as a, a country of the sub-Saharan region would be interested, uh, we would, in the Council of Europe, we would certainly want to have a dialogue and see uh, to what extent this can benefit uh, that country. Uh, because again, I believe that what we are saying in this is. Uh, is, uh, and what we are require, requiring to prevent violence against women and to, and to protect the victims is something which, to which all women in the world should have access. There should be no women left out of the loop. Uh, and that's why at the end of this convention, which sets out all these measures, it is stated that this convention is open for signature to non-member states. So it's a diplomatic uh, demarche, which uh, is in the hands of whoever wishes, whichever country is interested, and the Council of Europe is, is happy to discuss it. We have other examples of Council of Europe conventions which, are, which have been acceded to by countries far away. Uh, we have the Cybercrime Convention, which is in particular relevant for the issue of uh, uh, pedopornography which has been uh, um, uh, ratified by something like six uh, members, uh, six non-member states, including United States of America, but also some South American countries and uh, negotiations are ongoing with a number of other states in the world who want to adhere to the, uh, to the very principles enshrined in this convention. So this is another open convention, like the Convention on Sexual Abuse and Exploitation of Children, again, uh, principles and, 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 uh, enshrined in that instrument are also uh, ready for exportation to, uh, and, uh, and importation into other countries in the world. Thank you. Yes. You had just started talking about Morocco interested. Can you talk a little more about that? Yes. Uh, well, maybe you could also mention that uh, Jordan has Jordan, yes. So yes. the fact that two yeah. leading countries have expressed interest in this is very encouraging. Yes. We have, um, in the Council of Europe, we have developed uh, um, a modest neighborhood policy, uh, which means that there are cooperation programs um, which consist in discussing uh, 
what uh, what is happening in these countries and to what extent it fits in with the let's say the the standards which the Council of Europe uh, would like uh, countries to to have achieved uh, in order to qualify to be called a democratic country in which human rights and the rule of law are prevalent and um, so uh, in the in the context of this neighborhood policy we have uh, contacts with uh, uh, North America, uh, North Africa. Uh, it's also Tunisia, um, uh, but Egypt. We have also quite some had some uh, cooperation programs. It's now, uh, uh, for understandable reasons, uh, put on a low, a lower level of activity. Um, but Jordan, uh, as Charlie just pointed out, is uh, one of our other partners, uh, and uh, we are uh, actually this week. Uh, I was supposed to go to, to Amman for, um, for a conference in which uh, I would just uh, explain uh, what these conventions are all about, what they would require, and, um, and it's, organi it's organized by the authorities, central authorities. And of course, I mean, this is a, all a long process, I mean, this, uh, but we, we just feel it's very important that, that there are countries who, are, who, who want to make progress and they, they, they need to rely on international standards, and there aren't many, and especially on, well, on Lanzarote, uh, the sexual abuse and exploitation of children. It's a new, unique instrument. Uh, so, I mean, they, they are very interested to hear about how, how we came to these provisions, what is needed uh, to, to, make, to, make it, uh, to make it work. And um, so we are just outgoing towards these countries, uh, also trying to understand what are their problems and, and how that can be overcome. Uh, so it's really cooperation and assistance in both directions. We don't want to be seen as, you know, saying this is how it should be and this you should take it uh, as it stands. Uh, let's discuss all this. Let's have a dialogue and let's see where the problems are. So I hope I, I really hope this will uh, eventually lead to the um, to the um, uh, to the ratification uh, and uh, by, by by these countries. But for Morocco, we are far advanced because. Once these negotiations start, uh, it needs a formal invitation by the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe. And in respect of Morocco, having made much progress, we have uh, the Committee of Ministers has extended this invitation. So it's now it's a question of, you know, a few months still. So, so. there are 45, 45 people got together to do this. Uh, you said they brought the experience of best practices that they saw. Uh, had anybody gone to the bottom and say, here are things that work that may not be legal, and then pull that experience in? That no, may not be legal? What do you mean? In India there's an NGO called Ganti Bajao, which is ring the bell. That seems to be very effective. If you, if you hear somebody beating up at his wife, you ring the bell to borrow a cup of sugar. And they found it, it has reduced just knowing. There are practices out there that have worked. Um, now, I just one that I know I'm a small guy. These 45 people probably have a thousand times more experience. So not necessarily. I mean, they, they, I mean, as I said, they, these, these, they were not 45 people. There were many, many more. I said that each country sent something like three to four uh, officials to sit around the table. So there were over 100 people sitting around the table there. And, and they, but they, these are people who are uh, aware of what's going on in their country. And these were Europeans, so I'm not aware of this, what, what you refer to this. These are people who, who knew about domestic violence. In yes, I mean, that's their job, to deal with that in the ministry where they are. Not their only job. Yeah. We are coming to the end, and uh, Maud is leaving tonight. Uh, I'm sure Vidya and Charlie and we all would have liked to give you fresh roses. Oh. And so we have a little <coughs> that you can squeeze in your luggage, oh, and it will stay with you. Thank you. Thank you so much.